All right. I hit record just to warn everybody on the call. Um, and I'm here with a whole gaggle uh, <laughs> today because uh, I got the three story method editors here. Most of us anyway. Um, so let's go around. Um, I always it always feels weird saying let's go around because y'all can't see the order of in which you are on Zoom on my screen. So let's go around uh, and tell everybody. Um, who you are, uh, what uh, editing specialty you do, because all of us are editors. So what's your special editing specialty? And if you got a podcast, tell us your podcast too, because people are listening to this. So we might as well pump each other's podcast. Kathy, I'm going to make you go first. <laughs> okay. I'm Kathy Peeper, and um, I write uh, historical romance, um, time travel romance, and um, paranormal suspense and so those are also the um the areas where i would probably be more comfortable um editing and um no podcast no podcast just editing all day <laughs> editing and writing <laughs> yeah uh catherine oh, okay hi i'm catherine hernandez and i write mostly in the steampunk genre i do space opera and i'm diving into a bunch of fantasy I do edits and critique chapters, and I'm starting to go into a lot of detail for history. So if you like history and want it in your stories, come find me. Uh, my other thing would be my podcast is the Writer at Work podcast. Nice. And it is an excellent podcast. Nice. Um, I listen to it regularly. Uh, Adam. Yes, sir. How are you guys doing? Uh, thank you for uh, bringing us all along, Jeff, on this wonderful Thanks. journey. Thanks for uh, coming. My, absolutely. It's a, it's a pleasure. It's great to be here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so my name is Adam uh, Robertson. I write under the pen name uh, A.W. Robertson. Uh, I am a three-story method editor, um, just like we all are, as you introduced. And we, you know, we all specialize in the story of diagnostic, uh, which is absolutely awesome. Um, the, uh, the website that I have is craftandtradeauthorservices.com. It is a mouthful, but I rely on hyperlinks from, you know, show notes from Jeff Elkin's podcast to get people there. <laughs> um, I, I enjoy writing uh, epic adventure, fantasy type of work and uh, historical fiction, of course. And um, I think, uh, you know, my bailiwick, if you will, is sensory, uh, you know, sensory immersion in stories. And then, of course, the um, structure and plotting. I'm a huge plotter because I think if you build that foundation great from the beginning, you have a really strong, uh, you know, finished product, uh, which helps with the editing toward the end there. So that's me. Awesome. Uh, let's get, do Miss Christine. Hi, I'm Christine Daigle. Uh, I guess we're talking about writing. So I write uh, sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. Uh, one trad pub steampunk novel and two serials on Kindle Vela under LP Styles. I like editing sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. Imagine that. I like trad pub. I like uh, serial fiction, and I really enjoy working on character consistency. And I have a podcast, serialfictionshow.com. Also a fantastic podcast, which I love. I'm going to pump your podcast for a second. It has two halves to it. Because yes. on the first half, you interview the uh, serial, or the second half, you interview the writer. The first half, you actually read the serial fiction, which is awesome. Right. So we gear uh, one part, like one episode to uh, readers and the other one to writers where we talk about craft. If you're interested in writing serial fiction or, you know, writing in general, because there are great tips on there mm -hmm. uh, for writing. A lot of fun. I'll, I like listening to both because I can listen to what was written and then listen to the person talk about it, which is yeah. which is unique and pretty cool. I Thanks. Like that a lot. Yeah. Um, all right, Valerie. Sorry, I had to unmute because <laughs> I have dogs and I didn't want them to bark while you were talking. Um, yeah, I'm Valerie Isan and I write women's fiction and memoir. Um, I like women's fiction that leans just a little teeny bit of magical realism in there too that's my favorite genre to read and so therefore I want to write it too um, I edit um, all things <laughs> it doesn't have to be those two genres those are my favorites but I do I do it all and um, 
my podcast is um, Writer Craft Podcast. And as far as my editing specialty, I guess probably helping people find the core message in their memoir is probably where most people are interested in contacting me for. But and you just let me guest on the Writer Craft Podcast, which is great. It was a lot of fun, but it means yeah, that you'll have anybody on there, which is entertaining. Um, yeah, that was great. Uh, all right, Aaron. Uh, I'm Aaron Goldblatt. I operate under the uh, pseudonym V.E. Griffith. That's where you can find me, vegriffith.com. Um, and I, I, uh, I write and I read mostly uh, uh, science fiction, fantasy, urban fantasy, that sort of stuff. Um, and I'm doing uh, a little bit of coaching and uh, line and content edits in addition to the story diagnostic. So if, you, uh, if you're at the place where you need somebody to go over your commas, let me know. Awesome. Um, thanks. Aaron. So the reason I bring all of y'all on here, I don't know that I've ever explained this before. Um, the reason I bring all of y'all on here is because I have a massive amount of respect for each of you as editors. And uh, I think um, I like having these conversations because I, you know, when I started writing, I, I knew very little and was not connected to a community. So for me, it was just about like, what books can I grab to learn anything at all? Um, so I feel like now that I am connected to this community and have people of your incredible experience to tap into, um, I, uh, I feel like I want to share your experience with everybody else that might listen. So yeah, that's why we're, that's why we're here today. So we have been, this, I think this is the third time we've done this or the fourth time, third time or fourth time we've done this. So we're going through the story rubric. The story rubric is, um, it was put together by, Jay Thorne for the um, Author Life uh, blog and the successful author mastermind, the success author mastermind, the author success mastermind. That's it. The author success mastermind uh, group that he has to kind of help you qualify what makes your story good or not good. You can find it at his website, The Author Life. It's totally free. You can just download it. It's there. Um, there's all kinds of different versions on it. Uh, Aaron and Adam, before we came on, we were talking about how y'all are working on a historical fiction version just for historical fiction. I know there's a scene version of it. There's like a, um, anybody else know what the other versions are? Christine, have you put together a Vela version of it yet? No, but I should. <laughs> Just did one on beginnings and endings. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's, that's right. I remember seeing that go up. Um, Lillianne did one on memoir too. That's right. That's the other one I was looking for. Um, so yeah, so we're just going through it a piece of the time. And today we're talking about protagonist wants and needs. So I'm going to share my screen just for one second. So we can kind of look at what, according to the rubric, excellent protagonist wants and needs are. So, and this is a tool when any of these editors or myself do a story diagnostic for you, which is where we read through your story uh, in its entirety and um, and then break it down to kind of like, hey, here's what's good. Like, here's what's working. Here's what you need to work on. Uh, we'll use this rubric to do it. Um, st the story rubric. So breaking down protagonist wants and needs. I just want to look at what's excellent. Like y'all, if you if this is fascinating to you and you want to, I'm not going to sit here and read the whole thing. If you want to read the protagonist wants and needs, fantastic. It's free. You can download it. But I'm just going to jump to excellent because that's what we want. We want excellent stories. Uh, excellent. The wants and needs of the protagonist are well-developed in an authentic nuance that creates complex, engaging situations. Excellent characterization creates antagonists and partners for the protagonist that naturally flow into the themes of the story and push the protagonist toward maturity. So that's what we're going for. And that's what we're talking about today. Uh, and I want to start off asking y'all, because I think, you know, we could just define wants and needs, but that's a little philosophical. So let's talk about where we see it in the world. Um, where's somewhere where you've son, seen wants and needs for a character done really, really well? Anybody can jump in. There's no, yeah, don't just pop in. I'm always just like, I'm I analyze them in whatever I'm reading or uh, watching at the time. Um, lately, I've been watching uh, The Marvelous Miss Maisel, which has very, very clear wants and needs. I mean, she wants to do comedy, but
but the needs are like so much deeper. Like she's struggling with um, needing to fit into the world as a woman, but wanting equality and all these kind of deep things, uh, which just make it so, so interesting. And it's funny because I was watching that at the same time that I was uh, reading Midnight Bargain by uh, CL Polk, which kind of is the same same wants and needs for the character. The character wants just to do magic, but it really is like she needs to find equality and find a way to be accepted, uh, you know, as a woman in man's world. So I just thought it was so interesting how those two were thematically the same while I was looking at them the same time. And, you know, the character just wants to do their special thing, but That's they awesome. need to figure out how to navigate uh, the world to be able to do this. So it's really cool. That's yeah. super cool. I haven't yeah. read that one yet, but I do love The Marvelous Miss Maisel. Yeah, it's um, great. Yeah, and I don't know if I talked about this on the podcast or not, but they like they have some of the best dialogue ever. And season two, oh, episode so one, they've got a they've got a scene on a Ferris wheel where there's like six people all yelling at each other, and it is like some of the best dialogue I've read in a long, long time. It's fantastic. yeah, that was an amazing scene, and the yeah. poor. No, there's two sailors in the back that are like getting the bread <laughs> just so sitting there it was yeah. brilliant it was amazing super amazing uh okay anybody else great example of wants and needs y'all can just stay off of mute i'd, I'd rather us <laughs> just talk yeah so i read um, a so i read a book last year called wildwood whispers by willa reese it was one of my favorite books last year it's um Mm, sort of it's it's women's fiction with a little bit of magic in it there's some some herbal magic in there and um she starts off at the beginning of the book her 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 foster sister has has died and so she goes to her foster sister's hometown to kind of find out about her past and what she she wants to find out who who how she died and because uh, she thinks she was murdered so she's trying to find out who murdered her foster sister but really what she needs is that belonging and sense of community because she herself you know lives in the foster system or grew up there and always was running and moving and, and never had a place to belong so her want is driving her to find out who who killed her sister her foster sister but her need is to belong and and she finds that in in that hometown Nice. I love that. I, I was think, uh, yeah, go for it. Watching a Netflix show, which originally comes from a webtoons. I don't know if you guys know what webtoons is. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's I for do. those who don't, it is um <laughs> no clue. It's an app, but they promote people's graphic novels. So anybody can write and draw and they post chapters and you get one chapter a week. And you can like pay to read the faster ones or not. And so um, K-dramas have been picking up a lot of these webtoons. And now we're starting to get them on Netflix. Nice. And it's All of Us Are Dead. And it's a zombie apocalypse that happens in a high school. And it's really good. And the, the webtoon was, the art was a little strange. But it like follows the story really well. So like that was really cool. But the each character has their own like wants and needs as you're going through and they do really good job at like pinpointing each character throughout the the series being like this character really doesn't care about the rest of the group just this one person and like they need to keep this person alive or they won't make it through because like to them that person is everything and so it was really cool to watch each character have like their spotlight just enough so you you really care if that character dies or not that's cool it's a bonus you really want your people to care if your character dies <laughs> i mean like some of them you're like yes please die please be dead. <laughs> like die <laughs> but so like there, there are some where you're like oh no no he's gonna get eaten <laughs> that's awesome i had no idea that that came from like a uh, uh kind of indie source that's really cool mm-hmm down that's awesome anybody else work that you love um one that i thought was was good was um the uh, the greatest showman the movie um well he really wants to be like rich and famous and all that and it, but he kind of takes the 
too far at one point, but then he kind of comes back and realizing that he more wants it just to help people and his family and everything like that, and not just to just to make money. So I mean, I, I really I did like that movie. Yeah, and I loved how they like tied it into his like they kind of created that need out of his childhood in that movie too, which was really right. nice. Like bringing in like that he, you know, grew up poor and was kind of like cast out by these rich people and, you know, wanting to like having that deep need to like excel and live in that world. I thought was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's cool. I think mine, um, my all time favorite wants and needs book was one of like the first books I fell in love with, which was The Firm by John Grisham. Because mm-hmm. um, the the wants character by the protagonist, you know, like his want to like be this successful lawyer at the best law firm where he's going to make the most money and like kind of live growing up in this like poor place. Now he's going to like live the American dream. But the need to be seen as this like um you know having reached the pinnacle like this need to like having having grown to being at like the best of the best and having the most and like all of those status symbols that come with it i i i I think part of the reason i fell in love with the wants and needs of the book is because he really has to reject his need in order to maintain his family and like life really like (laughs) in order to continue to live he has to like Mm -hmm. put that need aside which was um he or at least deal with it and like work through it which uh yeah i I really i love that um i remember that just capturing me as a as a young reader um locking me in yeah adam or aaron y'all got either any uh wants and needs that stick out to you aaron go ahead the big one that occurs to me is is basically the entire Wheel of Time series. And I know it's like 14 or 15 books. And if you're going to listen to the whole thing on audiobook, you're in for a 650 hour escapade. But it's, you know, it's the the protagonists, the the there are three protagonists, and all three of them are very clear that they just want to go home and return to being a sheep herder and a, you know. The, they're they're involved in this high drama that you know the upon which rests the fate of the world and they just want to go be a blacksmith you know and it's really really neat to watch those characterizations grow and that conviction grow as the as the whole story arc moves forward and there are so many characters that you get the opportunity to see all of their wants and needs you know, grow and change over time. Even the even the relatively minor characters that that repeat. You know, you get to see what they want too. It's really really neat. It's a it's a powerful lesson in how to do characterization if you can stand to read something that long. That's awesome. Uh, Adam, yeah. So in? yeah. Well, I'll I'll jump in and uh, uh, if it's okay, I'll segue into the next question because it kind of does it kind of bleed into that. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to reference, um, a movie that came out in 2018 called black 47. Uh, and it, and it's basically, it's talking about the, uh, the summer of 1847, which was the Irish, uh, famine over a million people died and so forth. And the, the characters wants and needs the main, uh, protagonist and, and even a, a secondary character, um, you know, they're, they're coming back from being deployed as British uh, rangers and, and troops and so forth. And, and they were, the wants and needs are so engrossed and ingrained into their decisions. I mean, they need to survive. They need to provide for their families. So they leave their families in Ireland to fight for Brit, for, uh, the, for the English, for the British uh, army. And in doing so, they're able to be fed and get a little bit of money to send home. Uh, but when these, when these, uh, rangers come back home to ireland they find out that ireland is in the middle of a famine they're being mistreated the money's not going where they're said it's supposed to go to and so forth so you know the the main character um 
becomes basically like an anti-hero. Um, and if, if you're familiar, uh, I hate to make this analogy, but if you're familiar with the Rambo first blood, it's basically the same type of thing. You have a soldier coming home who's traumatized. He just wants to go home, return to his family. He comes home and he realizes that his home, his country, his family is just shattered and, and destroyed. So uh, he reacts um, by basically going on a rampage and, and he's got nothing to lose. So he takes the lives of all of those people who, who were, um, you know, allowing this, this atrocity to happen uh, in his home. And so, you know, I think the next question, how does an author use character wants and needs to engage the reader? Uh, and even to, you know, Valerie's uh, point that she's making here is, you know, it, it, when you can have those wants and needs collide, or you can even even with the sake of a villain or or an antagonist, if you can get the reader to to almost come to the point of empathizing with, yes, I I, I can see why they're snapping and and making those choices. I don't condone the choices that they make, but I can understand them. Uh, I think that's that's where the magic happens. If you understand what I'm I'm driving at here, so. I think the, the, the wants and needs of that particular movie, Black 47, you know, he wanted to just return home. He, he needed to, to have some fulfillment and healing from that, but he comes home and in his world's completely flipped upside down and it, and it uh, basically he snaps he di- and it dictates the rest of his, his life um, and, and his choices there. But how do you engage the reader with those wants and needs? You have those uh, external wants, there's internal needs, and they somewhat are conflicting. And then when they have that clash point uh, and cross over each other, that's where the true conflict of that story comes from. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think, you know, the wants are vital, right? You have to have a, a goal and, um, you know, ideally the same goal throughout the book uh, for the most part, because that's, you need a goal to have obstacles to make a reader be like, well, are they going to get their goal? So, I mean, really without wants, you don't have a book. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's just the truth. They got to want something. They want to want it badly. And a lot of stuff has to get in their way. That's a if, book, right? Yeah. If nobody wants a book, it's more like, if nobody wants anything, it's more like a nice poem on a Sunday. Night. Exactly. Yeah. Like it's a bunch of stuff that happens, but it's not a story. And then the, the needs are um, like wonderful I like to use them for, I don't know, I always get my terms mixed up, but I think it's dramatic irony where, you know, your audience or your reader knows something the character doesn't. So, you know, it's like, he just really wants a shiny red car, but the audience is like, you idiot, you don't need that car. What you need is love, right? And so that they can see it. So I love to use that so that the, um, the reader is like, every time they're making a mistake or going about problem solving wrong, going for this external want when it's not what they need. And it, you're just filling your reader with like dread or cringe or something visceral. And I think that's really important uh, in the writing process as well. And yeah, it's, where I think, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say that's where the tension happens Yeah, <laughs> between, exactly. the, between the wants and the needs and the struggle shows up that way for the reader. Yeah, I think it, this is a little off book, but I'm curious because it, you know, sometimes it feels like the need of the character is actually healthy. And maybe like the want is unhealthy, mm-hmm. like the way that they want to fulfill it is unhealthy. And then sometimes it feels like they're actually in line and it's kind of like the world is clashing against them. Does that make, am I making sense? And I'm just, I'm literally just throwing that out on the fly after listening to y'all's like what you liked and wants and needs. It feels kind of like one way an author can generate that conflict is deciding like, hey, is this um, is this character's wants and needs a healthy, positive thing that the world is like pushing back against? Or is this character like going to need to grapple with either what what the character wants being an unhealthy expression of the need or maybe even the need itself being unhealthy? Like, what do you all think about that? Thank you for saying that, actually, because my question was, I always thought that the the want was something the protagonist knew about, but that the need was deeper and they didn't know that. Yeah. And they found out about it later. And that was part of the, the character arc. But I've also read really great books like um, The Book Woman of Troublesome Creek. 
fantastic historical fiction. I loved that book. And I was trying to figure out what her arc was. And she had wants and needs at the beginning. And she knew that she was really pretty self-actualized and, and she just was prejudiced. She was, uh, the town was racist. Mm. So she knew that she wanted to find love. She knew that she wanted to be able to, um, be a strong woman and have a job and, you know, find herself, but the world was not letting her do that. And so that makes sense. I couldn't figure out like how that, how that fit into a good book. If they didn't, if they knew what their need was already, how did that make, how did that character arc work? So yeah. that makes sense now. Thank you for saying yeah. that. Yeah. That's interesting. Like I'm thinking, um, I keep coming back to this book. I, I read it over a year ago and it just keeps coming back into my mind, I think because the characterization is so strong, but I keep thinking about a man called Ove by, uh, Friedrich, uh, Bachman and, that character is very similar his he knows exactly what he needs he's lonely and he needs companionship but he's going about getting it in the completely wrong way mm -hmm. and so the arc of this story is him failing to get it how he wants it and then finding a new way or actually accepting a new way to fill that need yeah and I, I think, uh, you know, I think in romance, it's common too. It's like what they want yeah. is love and what they need is love. But if you look at something like Bridget Jones, it's like she wants a relationship, but she's doing it with a totally wrong man and going about it totally the wrong way at the beginning until she like kind of gets herself together and is like, okay, I, I do still want and need love, but with a healthy and mature person, right? So I think that happens a lot. But I, I think too, you know, I think... Um, it's kind of neat and there's a lot of richness and depth when there's a, a want that's different than the underlying need. But I think there are books too with flat characters where you just have an external want and there's really no need. You know, if you think about like uh, Jack Reacher or James Bond, what do they need? You know, I think they're all one. I think those are very external books. <laughs> to be entertained. I feel to like Reacher walks around just trying to be entertained <laughs> yeah, by beating people up. I don't know. I could argue, I've read several Reacher books, and I could argue that Reacher has a deep internal need to be the military policeman he was. And like, you know, he's left the military, he's out of the military, but he does wander around solving crimes. It's a little like the A-Team. Like, yeah. <laughs> the A-Team's on the run from the military. They don't actually have to stop in every town and help somebody. They could just keep going. But they have this, like, weird need to, like, fulfill that sense of heroism. Like, you know, the sense of, like, I am the hero in this story. Mm -hmm. um, they want to be important. Yeah, and, and like, they want to be significant. Like, there's, like, a sense of, like, purpose and significance that, like, they're looking mm -hmm. for in that, like, attempt to bring other people justice. Yeah, I don't know. I'm also just talking off the top of my head. So if there's a hardcore Reacher fan listening, it's like, no, that's dumb. Reacher wants nothing. Uh, you know. <laughs> all he, I think all he, he wants, wants something, but what does he need? Like, I think, yeah. he, you know, it's like if you look at, okay, not the last James Bond movie, we're going to forget about that one because that was like way out of it. But if you look at like the early Bond movies, it's like, what does he need? I don't know. Like what he wants is to do his job and he does his job. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the end. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. He needs to meet the latest Bond girl in the movie. And, you know, yeah. 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 By the pool. Yeah, by the pool, usually in a <laughs> bikini of some kind. Yeah. Any other thoughts on how an author can take that want and need um, and really drive some good plot conflict in the book to engage the reader? I think something we've all mentioned that we're not saying directly, but we should probably say it is that the want and need drives your character maturity as well. So like part of what I think drives that reader engagement is the character growth over time. And we see their like struggle with that want and need. Um, it's funny, you know, it's like so strong that like it really can define a character Um I was watching the Obi-Wan Kenobi, this is going to be a weird thing. I was watching the Obi-Wan Kenobi trailer today. Um, I should have been working. Don't tell, don't tell my boss. <laughs> um, no, it was during my lunch break. I was watching the Obi-Wan Kenobi trailer today and it was, uh, um, 
they have a scene of like a young Luke Skywalker sitting on top of a hut pretending to be a like starship fighter and pilot and it's like man that they we're now like eight movies into this thing that this guy's shown up in and that want and need is still defining his character <laughs> all, all the way through this like whole saga he's still this you know we still think of him as this little kid wanting to be a fighter pilot um yeah anyway it, was, it struck me as funny because we were talking about this tonight um, well, and i i think if i can jump in i think we you know you're you're talking about the maturity of the character and that's the character arc the development of the character if the character at the beginning of the book is the same as the character at the end of the book you know there's all kinds of different things is, is it just meant to be entertainment and like a jack reacher or a james bond i mean if it's just entertainment and it's shallow then it's successful or like uh you know what valerie was saying you know maybe the the arc of change is the community that the main protagonist is driving or representing hey there is some change that needs to occur so the arc of change is happening in the community or there's people around that individual but i you know maybe maybe the conversation again shooting from the hip maybe the conversation is the depth of the story you know if it's a shallow story there isn't a, car, a, a character arc of change that's significant enough to define wants and needs as if it was a very deep book with engaging characters and engaging plot and setting and so forth so in those types of stories you have an example of characters who who do change uh, pretty dramatically from the beginning of the book act one to the end act three you have a you have a clear arc of change because there is the external internal conflict that's being portrayed and, and handled there so maybe maybe we're talking about a spectrum of type of entertainment i mean we we write because we want to provide escapism and immersion and and all kinds of different things sometimes people just you know want to read a book or watch a movie for entertainment's sake and they you know they, they'll put in a james bond movie just to see things blow up and you know like like all those things that we talked about or they want to read something or, or watch something that's a little bit more in depth where you you walk away and you you know you have a different world viewed as a result so i don't know just thought yeah no adam has... hit on a good Sorry, no, no please go ahead please go ahead oh i was just gonna say i think adam hit on a good point about the this the conflict in the character when they've got the need and the want that's causing that um conflict within and that's what shows the reader that maturity because they hit that conflict and maybe they have like a knee-jerk reaction and it's you know negative or it's mm -hmm. it's the same old that they always had before and then they come up with another obstacle and maybe it's the same reaction but then they think oh i shouldn't have done that and then the next time they hit a an obstacle then they actually choose to make a different choice at that time and and then by the end of the book, you, you, you know, you incrementally show that change in their reaction based on their internal needs and uh, external wants. Yeah. I like that a lot. I like that. I like that idea that like the choices the character is making need to, you know, there need to be mistakes made in trying to meet their need and then slowly, ideally, unless it's a tragedy and then the mistakes just get worse and worse <laughs> until they die. Um, but, it, you know, in, a, in an upswing story. And you can show that in dialogue too, that internal dialogue. Yeah, 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 totally. We'll talk more about that. <laughs> talk more about that? You're the yeah. dialogue doctor, dude. <laughs> <laughs> People listen to me all the time. I was leading you Y'all <laughs> There, of of all the leads ever in the world, there was nothing more obvious, right. Jeff, than that. Of, of all the softballs pitched, that was the one to strike out on. Yeah, no, I think. Oh, go ahead, please. Um, when you, when the character is faced with a choice, and they have that internal dialogue that pops up that says, "Oh, I shouldn't have done that," or. I'm such an idiot or whatever. And then the next time, the next time they're faced with an, another struggle, the reader needs to know what's going on in their head. And, and, and that's what the internal dialogue is for. And that's the only way really to show, I mean, it's not the only way, but it's like, I think the best way to show internal struggle. 
Um, you can show it through their actions, but often that gets buried in the other action that's happening in the scene. So I think internal dialogue is really important to show inner struggle. Yeah, and I will give a tip for that, that like if you're going to do that internal dialogue where they're processing the mistakes they've made, don't process it as they're making the mistake. Like I see, I get a lot of uh, writers that I work with doing that where they're like in the midst of making the mistake, they're thinking about I'm making the mistake, but it, you'll get a bigger emotional hit with your reader if they make the mistake and then as they're experiencing the consequences, that's when they start to realize they made the mistake. So like it, it takes the reader down a train that way. Unless yeah. the purpose is to show that growth right then, like they start yeah. doing it and they realize, oh no, wait a minute, I'm going to, no, 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 pulling way back and I'm processing really quick and okay, I'm going to make another decision right now. And, and so they're changing their mind right then. Yeah, that turning point's really could, important. I think you're, it could work super there. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Catherine, we cut you off. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, um, I also like when the inner dialogue then shows like the character has understood what their needs are. So now they will align their needs to like their wants. So that I way, see. like that maturity is growing through the character. So they're not really clashing anymore. He gets it or she gets it, they get it. And then they're aligning themselves to try to fit both the wants and the needs together. I, see. I think what we're, I was just saying, I think what we're talking about or dancing around is what like many people have called the mirror moment when you see it in fiction all the time, um, usually around the midpoint of a novel where a character has been, you know, maybe not making the best choices or the most mature, mature choices or solving problems in a way that's maybe not so great. And, you know, they either through action or dialogue or both take a look at themselves and are like, what am I doing here? This isn't working out for me. Who am I? Do I want to be this person? And you know what? I think I'm going to try some things differently. Um, and that's when you start to see, you know, that's the midpoint of the arc where then you start to see them solving problems differently. And there's still obstacles and things that, that are getting in their way, but like, you know, they've made a change. And oftentimes it's like, I'm looking in the mirror. Um, I'm trying to think that book, what's it called? Write your novel from the middle. And they talk mm -hmm. about that in Lethal Weapon where um, the Mel Gibson character, not that I'm a Mel Gibson fan, but, uh, you know, is like, uh, his cop buddy is like, oh, if you're going to kill yourself, do it. And he's like, I've got this bullet for me. I'm going to put it in me. And his mirror moment and when he's like, you know what? Here's the bullet. I'm done. I don't need it anymore. And that's like his mirror moment. And then when you start to see his growth and his change. Um, but like, I think if you look at most well done movies or books, you can pick that up. You can be like, here is where their character looks himself in the face and is like, I'm an idiot. I need to do things differently. And then they start on their growth curve. Something else that, that can be mentioned there with, with respect of that, that maturation and Christine, your example kind of brings it out is that mentor, whether it be a mom or a sibling or a friend or a colleague, or just somebody that is serving the mentor role, that mentor role is that objective uh, third party it doesn't have to be internal dialogue. You can have a mentor come along and smack you across the back of the head and say, hey, man, you need to grow up. Or did you think about how your actions help, you know, hurt other people or, you know, whatever, however that works, this mentor is working through. And then, like you said, at the at the halfway point, you kind of have that realization something needs to change. You do have obstacles and you do ultimately have a test to say, did you actually change or was that, you know, surface level or was there an actual deeper change there. So a mentor can also be used to help mature that character through their arc. Yeah. And, and, oh, go ahead and one of the, 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 one of the interesting mechanisms that I've seen used for that is the repeating scene where they wind up having to, you know, the same thing happens to them three or four or five times in over the course of the story. And each time they make a different choice and each time it gets a little bit better you know, until they get to the end when, you know, they have learned whatever it is they're supposed to learn from all the mistakes that they've made. But it, it winds up being a really, a really good device to get those kind of growth moments into the story, at least for me. Yeah, especially if you get those at the beginning and the end of the story. Like if you, you know, um, 
we just did a book club back last fall on the house of the cerulean's the house on the cerulean sea I and love that he, book. yeah and he does that Wonderful he, has, book. he has a scene where he's his lead character is in an is in an office and then goes to speak to upper management and then goes home and then at the end of the book he has a scene where the same character is in the same office where the same character goes to speak to upper management and the same character goes home and you have and in both scenes they get a the lead character gets an introduction to um they get like the conversation that follows those scenes he then talks to one of the same kid at the island and then he talks to the same he talks to the headmaster and you can see the character growth you're saying Aaron, like the difference in the character before uh and after based on kind of like how the choices they make and the, the choices the character makes in those scenes change um yeah so we've said you know you're showing you can as a writer you can show that maturity um through uh the choices the character is making right like we can show like the mature the wrestling with the wants and needs and the like change of the character arc with the choices they're making with the internal dialogue like using internal dialogue to, to actively process what's going on we've said um that we can do it through that like repeated scene and that a lot of times a mentor is really helpful to point out like the need for change or like to drive to that mirror moment where you're like okay you can't keep going like you're going until things break um i will throw in also that like um if you're not using internal monologue because i never in, in my and i write thrillers and internal monologue is is not usually around in thrillers um, and I grew up reading like Clancy and Grisham and like, so the books I grew up reading, there wasn't any internal monologue. Uh, so <laughs> the, um, so voice modulation can be a really good way to show that like character growth, meaning that like um, the character's voice is going to mature as it goes through in like baby steps all the way through, which also works really well with a repeated scene where you can see the character's voice change so like going back to the house on the cerulean sea linus the main character is very uncertain at the beginning of the book and his internal he has internal monologue but his internal monologue and his external voice are very out of sync but then by the end of the book his external voice and internal monologue are completely in sync because he's speaking what he has to say so you see that maturity or like in um pride and prejudice uh the the oh why can't i think of the lead character's name um, Elizabeth Lizzie thank you Lizzie <laughs> at, at the beginning of the book Lizzie's voice is very um reactive to what's going on around her she like is constantly like blurting out what's happening around her by the end of the book she has a much more mature voice where she's like processing what's happening um in the world and it shows her like maturity and prejudice of like social class and like her like ability to um remove some of that like or deal with the pride that she has um in order to actually see other people with a clear lens so it's got that like you know development in her voice as the story goes on which is um that like tweaks in modulation i was trying to pull it off in the book that i just wrote um i don't know if i did we'll find out it comes out in may uh but <laughs> in the beginning of the book i have the, the character's like internal need um is to uh achieve something great and uh there's like a deep feeling at the beginning of the book that he's a failure so i use the phrase i'm sorry all the time he's constantly apologizing for things but then right around the mirror point in the book the i'm sorry becomes a like i don't understand what you're saying so i actually keep using the same phrase but like turn it maybe we'll see if it works turn it in the in the middle of the book to have a completely different meaning in conversation and he uses it at a different place in the sentence like so at the beginning of the book he's saying i'm sorry like in the middle of his sentences he'll be like you know i didn't know i'm sorry i'm sorry that happened you know and you know we'll fix it but then at the end of the book he actually leads with it he's like i'm sorry what did you just say and it's that like taking that phrase that he's using and flipping it to try and show his character growth. But yeah, just one way that I was playing with it recently. So I have a question for the hive mind. Um, when you're writing a character and you're trying to show that growth and, you know, in real life too, and 
in our fiction, they take two steps forward, one step back. You know, it's not just like, okay, mirror moment. Now I'm all better. You know, you're going to show like this start, stop and go making mistakes still until they get to the end of the book. But how do you do that without creating irritation in the reader? Like, I thought they'd fix this already. I thought they've, you know, why is he still making the same mistake? How do you prevent that from happening? Good question. I don't have an answer. <laughs> I wonder, do they have to make mistakes? I see a lot of books where after the shift, they're, um, they're just the obstacles are, are so high stakes, even though they're making the right decisions, they, they're just coming against so many obstacles that they're just not making headway. And so a lot of time they still have to just keep like, keeping, keeping believing that what they're doing is, is good until, you know, their reward is very delayed in the end. So I've seen that done too. I wonder if that has to do with if the want and need are healthy and it's the world pushing back on them or if the want yeah. and need have to change. I think if the want and need have to mature and change then or evolve, evolve is probably the word we should be using. If the want and need have to evolve, I wonder if then there has to be mistakes made. I think so. I mean, that sounds realistic to me. If you're trying to change an ingrained belief pattern, maybe the characters um, and flaw has to do with this deep wound. You know, they can't just like change it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, I'm all better now. Like there has to show, we have to be realistic. It's not going to be believable if they just have that one like epiphany moment and then it's all better. And they have to relapse. And sometimes relapse. they have to. Yeah, there's going to be relapses. You're going to have relapse, and, and that's absolutely true. And sometimes you also have to you reap what you sow. So there's consequences to the mistakes you've made before mm-hmm. based on your worldview. Um, you know, and like like Jeff was saying, evolve. I, I wrote down learn. I mean, we're always learning. We hurt people. We learn. We make mistakes. We learn. We have to uh, evolve and show that value shift in our writing and in our lives. So just because we have a mere moment doesn't mean that somebody that we potentially hurt a couple of years ago or a couple of chapters ago isn't going to show up. And then, you know, you have to reconcile that. Um, yes, I hurt you. And I understand that now. And I didn't understand it then. So I apologize. So, um, you know, that's another way to show they're still, they're still that same person, but they're, they are learning, they are maturing and uh, they, they still have to, you know, atone for some of the pain that they've caused. That, mm, I, like I that. read a, a series. Go ahead. Go ahead, Catherine. Okay. I had uh, read a series that everything like led up to the ending, but it's for the first book. And she had guessed wrong who had been the killer the entire time until just at the ending. And like it like shocked her to the point that it caused like real bad trauma for her. And then in book two, she has to face that trauma with every decision that she's making. So she's like, am I making the right choice this time? Or is this like a person who's close to me going to die again? And so like that also, I think helps because she had just been so headstrong being like, nah, man, I know who this is the entire time for the book. And like you as the reader, we're pretty sure she was right the entire time. And then like the last two chapters, you're like, ooh there was like that one sentence in chapter one and I should have picked that up. And so like, I think there's also that where you can show trauma or PTSD from stuff that's happened and that can pop up as being the new obstacle for them Mm. to have to move forward because they might be able to be like, yes, I can do this piece, but doing it like sets me on edge even though I know it's right. And they have to work through those new sections. So it doesn't have to be the same problem coming up each time. Yeah. And I think like when you're looking at, someone talked about the test earlier, I forget who it was. It might've been Adam, but you know, I'm thinking about Bridget Jones again, where she's like at the midpoint, she's like, am I going to be stuck in this job and doing the same things and making the same mistakes? Nope. I'm quitting. I'm going to go start a new job. And it's scary. Um, but then they have that scene at the end where she's like with her family at Christmas and, you know, the bad guy comes back and he's like, but I still love you. Like I can change. Like I've left this person that I was with that I was cheating on her and you were cheating on when I was cheating on everybody. 
don't pick him, pick me. You still love me. And she has to look at him and be like, you know, oh, you know what? I've outgrown you. I've grown. You haven't. I'm going to make a healthy choice now. But it is like a final test and kind of like all the demons of the bad choices that she made at the beginning accumulated into one. And it's a test like, oh, she still has feelings for him. Has she really matured? Is she going to make the same mistake again? But then she makes the right right call, right? Showing that she really has finished that arc off. So Yeah. Also a repeated yeah. scene, by the way, because she, yeah, she has moments with her family and her friends at the beginning, middle, and end of the book. And they, yeah, the, at the, the curry writer, buffet or whatever it is. Yeah. It's like turkey curry buffet. <laughs> yep. And the, the writer uses it as a demarcation point along along her character journey to show yeah. how she changes in each moment. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. I just want to add too, because we've mentioned wound a lot and, you know, I, I'd be interested to hear how y'all think wound and want go together. For me, the want is the character's uh, it, like internal desire to solve that wound. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Do y'all see it differently? Would y'all agree with that? How do you see the I want? I agree with that. Wound? That's that's how I think, it, you know, the want stems out of the wound in some way. Yeah, I think usually. that that I would agree with that. I yeah. usually use Libby Hawker's um, character flaw mm. when I am yeah. starting with a new book. So I, I find a flaw for them that that um, really life changing flaw. This could ruin your life if you continue down this path mm. and that by the time they reach that global choice, they have to kill the flaw before they can make that choice or maybe the Maybe it's dying as you're making the choice. I don't know, but but yeah. that has to that has to go away before you can make that global choice. Yeah, yeah, I like thinking about them in conjunction. Like, does that flaw come from that wound? And often it does, right? So mm -hmm. it's a protection me yeah. mechanism or a coping mechanism that you developed. But you know, it's like a maladaptive coping mechanism from that wound. I guess I don't always I know what the what the wound is in my character when I start <clears throat> writing, but I know what the flaw is. I think, I think that is applicable to protagonist and antagonist, whether it be a you know villain or or whatever. I think if you if you have once, perhaps that's kind of the band aid or the surface level. This is how I'm going to cope. I like Christine's word there. That's a coping mechanism, um, but the internal need also stems from that wound. Um, and if it's a, if it's an antagonist, I think it makes the antagonist that much stronger. I mean, you, you have, if you can, if you can get to that point where you feel like you can empathize with why the antagonist acts the way they do, I understand why they're doing it. I don't condone it. Or I probably, you know, on my worst day, hope I'd never act that way. Um, I, I think it makes a more believable character and it's true for the protagonist as well. I think one approach to that would be the, uh, you know, and this is not hard and fast rule, but the ones are just, how do I cope with it? Uh, how do I avoid it? How do I not have to deal with my wound? Um, but the, the need is I have to find some healing and, and uh, you know, um, resolution for that wound. But I think it's applicable to protagonists and antagonists. I think it makes both of those characters uh, so much stronger. Yeah. I like that. And you know what? I, I like that point you brought up because just I love it when the the protagonist and the antagonist sort of have the same issue. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So they're they're the same, but uh, you know, the antagonist just doesn't change, he doesn't grow out of that flaw. And then I mean, that's yeah, I agree with you there. And I think it's when you can mirror those two. Um yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. it, um, to, to um, sorry to interrupt you, but I think to finish oh, your ahead. thought, I think that makes it such a, a, a deeper conflict in the story is if they're both the antagonist and protagonist are both stemming from the same place, mm -hmm. but you have one that chose to go left and one that chose to go right or whatever, you know, they're, the way they deal with it is starkly different. And that, you know, you can understand that. Um, I, I am... Uh, here's a, this is a totally dumb example. Um, and I'm not a huge, I'm not a huge fan of the Skywalker saga. I like the expanded universe of star Wars. I think there's some really beautiful things in there, but if you actually dive into the character of Anakin Skywalker, he became the, like the, the worst villain in the entire universe with the force and killing everybody and blah, blah, blah. And the emperor's, you know, proxy war, whatever. But all of that stems back to 
he lost his mom. He never had a dad. He lost his, you know, anybody that served a father figure for him. And he knew he was going to lose his wife. And he just wanted to save her life and save her kid's life. And that's where her choice or where his choice stemmed from was, I just want to save somebody who I love and not let them die. And because he chose the dark side, that led to him becoming the master villain that he was. So you can empathize with that character, with that villain, because who, who wants to stand back and allow their loved ones to die when you have the force and can save their life? Again, that's a, that's a, obviously it's a sci-fi fantasy type of example, think- but that's a great example of how a villain can be empathetic. I think that it's really powerful if you can have the protagonist and the antagonist have the same goal and and then that shows the reader how close the protagonist could fall into that antagonist role if they you know made a certain different choice and that creates 100%. a lot of tension and you know it, yeah. not excitement but <laughs> Like there's a lot of like stress for the reader, you know, reading that because it's so close. They both want the same things. Don't go kind of like um, Harry Potter and Voldemort. And, you know, he's always got that, like, (gasps) I don't want to be Voldemort, but you know, God, it's so close sometimes. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, to, to name drop two other of our uh, (laughs) three story method editors, and we got to bring them up on every podcast so that we can all take a drink. JP and Chris Kane were- I know. Oh, uh, JP and Chris Kane were talking on the um, Right Away podcast that came out today about how Katniss Everdeen and uh, Snow, um, and I would throw in mm. the leader of District 13, I think it is, that I can't remember her name, but how they all three actually want the exact same thing, which is... Yeah kind of like stability of their world they're all just kind of looking to bring stability to their world and it's that kind of competing desire that in in those three characters that competing want in those three characters that brings out the major conflict um kathy i'm gonna pick on you as 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 a romance writer editor talk to us a little bit about how wants and needs work when you've got those like dueling um you know, characters that have to come together. Can I put you on the spot? You can refuse to answer the question if you want. You'd be like, no, Jeff, I'm not answering that. Um, well, I mean, a lot of times with the romance, um, you know, part of the, you know, part of the problem might be um, being able to open themselves up to love or, you know, trusting others or um, something along those lines. And, um in the romance the 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 hero and the heroine they are kind of they are kind of the opponents of each other and um you know there also may be you know another antagonist but they're kind of the opponents of each other and um kind of by um getting together they kind of they they kind of help the other person where the other person is weak and um and then the other person helps them where they where they're weak usually is okay, kind of interesting yeah. so it's i would you say it's critical or can you get away so can you get away with just one of the characters having clear wants and needs or when you're writing a romance do both the hero and the heroine have to have their own wants and needs how does that work as somebody who um, has you, never attempted romance this is a mystery <laughs> to me. you can you can get away with only one but um Usually, I kind of think it's better for two, but I mean, you can have only one. Um, like, well, for instance, one one of the books I was working on, um, the hero didn't have that much of a um, change. He kind of, I mean, he had a few things he changed, but he mostly kind of stayed the same, and it was more the hero one that had the change. So a lot of times, one of them has to change more than the other, though they both probably maybe change a little bit. But. Gotcha. I wonder if you get like a Fabio effect with that. If the hero doesn't have to change, if he's just like the, you know, famous bare chested guy on the front of the romance book, who is the, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Just, in, yeah. in a kilt, of course. In a, in a kilt. kilt. In a kilt. Long flowing <laughs> Shirtless, hair. long flowing hair. Yeah. Yeah. My wife is upstairs watching the new season of Outlander right now. So maybe that's why that's on my mind. 
Um, Jamie's going to go wrestle a, a gator or a bear or something huge again to, yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. So let's talk about mistakes that writers may. Oh no, I'm sorry. I wanted to go to this. So Catherine, talk about what you were saying in the chat. Cause that's super interesting. Um, I like to throw the wounds in while writing the story. So they don't start with a wound sometimes. And then you will throw in the wound to, you know, throw a wrench at them because torture your characters and that can shift their wants and needs. So like in one of them, one of my characters is the druggie of the group. He's just always high. And because of it, he lands up killing someone. And that leads to him having like really bad anxiety with it. It spirals him in like a really bad direction. And it's trying to like get out of that. But at the same time, they have to like consistently deal with the amount of drugs that are still like around in the system. Interesting. So you're way. using like a traumatic event to shift the wants and needs mid story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. That it reminds me, I'm bringing since in this podcast, I'm mentioning books I read a year and a half ago. It reminds me of The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt, where, you know, the lead character experiences this bomb attack in this museum that kills his mother that kind of starts off his wound and then like you know two-thirds of the way into the book he has to go live with his dad or half the way through the book he has to go live with his dad in vegas and who's like this kind of drunken druggy con man and all of a sudden the wants and needs radically change <laughs> like every, everything's different yeah yeah but like taking him through that kind of traumatic event to create something something new that's really interesting yeah. okay what mistakes do we see authors making in wants and needs not having any not having any, just flat too, characters yeah. just yeah. being an episodic this happens and then this happens so i guess there's a want and a need like with each episodic thing but they're not really growing it's just sort of this happens then this happens and then it's too linear yeah i, I find know. that a lot if i'm editing somebody I, I can always pick that out when the character isn't making any choices when like things are happening to the character and the character's just kind of like moving from one scene to the next and not mm -hmm. actually having any proactive action in the book it, it creates that like you know <laughs> or they'll have a reaction but it will be verbal yeah and there's no internal dialogue so there's no internal struggle i can't see him making any choices he's just sort of reacting and yeah and he's just like watching it happen like and there's no maturity it's just like you know oh no this terrible thing is happening to this poor person and they're just gonna have to take it on the chin again <laughs> yeah. yeah i was gonna say changing the wants and needs mid book <laughs> <laughs> you said that about the wrench i was like but well, wait how does that work but you know you know <laughs> yeah i think it's important though because that's a difficult technique to do well um but changing the goal or changing the wants and the needs with no compelling reason uh like without the traumatic event um is a mistake so if they want one thing at the beginning of the book and then they want something radically different a third of the way through and something radically different for the last third with no particular reason, that's a mistake. <laughs> yeah, I think the key to changing wants and needs is that if they change and you're doing it well, the theme of the book stays consistent. Yeah. So like the character's wants and needs can change as long as the book remains about the same thing. Does that make that sense? That actually like, can show character development too. Because if their wants and needs change, maybe they understood that their previous want was shallow or it wasn't going to get them what they really needed and then yeah. they understood their need. And so now they've changed their mind about what it is that they want. Yeah, yeah. I think that it goes to work. the deeper need though, usually stays the same, but there's something there yeah. that typically stays the same throughout the book. Yeah. I think about um, Mark Zuckus had a, he wrote the book thief, but before he wrote the book, thief, he had one called I am messenger um, about a guy that keeps getting mysterious notes that send him on tasks to like do tasks. And uh, in oh, the, have you read it? it's really good yeah it's so um, good yeah it's um I, I won't spoil the ending disappointed in the ending but yeah. great book <laughs> uh yeah it had a, it had a very much like you know you could see him writing it and be like i don't know how to end this uh so, so he's just like and here's it in. uh so yeah but anyway 
at the start of the book it's more a mystery of like I need to figure out who's doing this and his want and his need is to like understand what's happening to him. But then as the book continues, he finds this like real empowerment and doing these activities that this person is sending him. And so suddenly the want and need become like a a re-understanding of self. And it is that like change in want and need in that he didn't, at the beginning of the book, he doesn't realize his life is lacking. And then through doing these things, he starts to realize like, oh, my life is lacking. And Zuckus does this really interesting thing. I don't know if I'm saying his last name right. He does this really <laughs> interesting thing where he uh, he uses the guy's apartment as a symbol of his internal change. Yeah. So like at the first, his apartment's like trashed and there's nothing there and things are crap. And then as he moves through the book, he's like cleaning things up. He's like trying to get his that the apart his desire to clean the apartment is like the character evolution which is really interesting um but the theme stays the same the whole time the theme the whole time is about like what is the significance of life and do you think jeff that he had the same need at the beginning of the book but just wasn't aware of it when you say that that's no i don't i think that it's one of those weird books where like the need actually he actually discovers a need as he grows um you know it's it it's a little goodwill hunting without the genius <laughs> where like at the, at the beginning and goodwill hunting, he has, he has complex needs going on, but like you could argue in goodwill hunting that Will's need is um, family and connection and that that need evolves as he grows. But there is definitely in that book, a discovery of a need for like, you know, significant in that movie significance in the world right like there's a need for like Mm -hmm. how am i going to contribute to the world as a person and that need kind of grows out of his therapy sessions with the robin williams character um it's another one where he's like discovering this need that he has as the book goes on and the evolution of that as the movie goes on the evolution of that need is kind of the journey we want for the character i will say for both of those characters and i don't know if this is standard now i'm just rambling but i will say for both of those characters it is interesting that as the reader and the viewer of the movie you understand the need you understand that that need that character needs to evolve Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that like if that character stays the same this is going to be a massive disappointment in both mm-hmm. in both the movie and the book. Like you see Will from the opening, you're like, oh, this kid needs to figure out how he's going to contribute to the world. Same in I Am Messenger. You see the kid, there's a bank robber at the opening. And you're like, oh, this kid, <laughs> this kid doesn't know it yet, but he needs to grow up. So <laughs> it's that kind of like, you know, yeah. I, th- um, I think another way to, to reframe your example um, you know, the, the need maybe doesn't change, but the way that it's applied or the way that it's approached does. Like, um, I, I start out the book with, I need food and water to survive. So uh, I, I want, you know, lobster tail and, and champagne. That's food and liquid. I mean, why? that's what I need. But then by the end of the book, you're saying, okay, I just, I just need protein and H2O. Or like in, in Goodwill Hunting, he starts the book or the, the, the movie and the book by saying, I need to be significant. I need to have a connection to family. And by the end of it, I need significance, but my family is now the entire world. Where can I can connect with the entire world? So it's similar need, but it's just kind of reframed and looked at from a different perspective of broadening your horizon, your worldview is expanded, whatever the case is. So I think in that case, I mean, it's, it's, it's done really well. The need is similar, but different enough to expand the uh, the maturation of that character. Yeah, yeah. I think it's so realistic too. And I think that readers really connect to the character when their wants and needs are realistic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Believable, I guess. Yeah. yeah. A better word. Yeah, I would say um, I like the word authentic. Authentic mm-hmm. to our understanding of personhood and like if it doesn't feel like this is something a person would really want, <laughs> then we, we disconnect from the character. Uh, any more mistakes we can think about um, that authors are making that listeners should possibly watch out for? 
think having too extreme, like they're so far away from each other that you're like, there's, there's no way that that works. You mean characters extreme or like wants? No, like the the wants and needs are like so opposite of each other that you're like, that doesn't seem to fit at all. Gotcha. So like the, the need, the internal need is like, I need a sense of family. So the want is like, I'm going to buy a sailboat. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see that. Yeah. All right. Well, we've, I've held you already like, past time that i told you i'd hold you so um <laughs> real quick let's go through and uh tell everybody where they can find thank you for, so much for coming on and having this conversation with me it was it was a lot of fun uh, and i learned a ton today which is great um which is well, why i bring you guys on here not for the podcast so that i can learn things um it's, it's all about me uh so yeah tell us real quick where we can find uh your stuff and where your um what promote something Aaron, we'll start with you. Uh, you can find me at vegriffith.com. T- come take a look. Nice. Valerie? Valerie Isan, ihsan.com and Writer Craft Podcast. Nice. Kathy? Kathy Peeper, that's C A T H Y P E P E R.com. Awesome. Uh, Miss Catherine? I am at scribes-pen.com and I'll be having series series Bible templates up pretty soon. Adam? Uh, You can find me at craftandtradeauthorservices.com and and I'm uh, entrenched in the TASM universe. Fantastic. That's the Author Success Mastermind. I used that acronym today and somebody was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, (laughs) Christine? (laughs) Uh, you can find me at christinedagobooks.com and awesome. serialfictionshow.com. And serialfictionshow.com. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop the recording uh, and we can chat a little bit more. Thanks, Jeff.